So today I'm going to be talking about weed ID and consideration, as I just said. <laughs> and before I get started, I know this is an ugly slide, but <laughs> before I get started, I just want to give a little bit of a disclaimer. Um, I am not a, a weed or herbicide expert. I'm not a certified pest control advisor. And today I'm not going to be making any recommendations about what to spray or how to spray any weeds. Um, if you do have specific questions about her what herbicides to use, when to use them, how much to spray, you should definitely contact a certified pest control advisor. Those are the folks who have gone through the correct training and know all of the rules around um, herbicide use. But with all that said, um, I am a livestock and natural resources advisor, and I get a lot of questions related to weeds and controlling weeds, like questions about herbicides. So I compiled a bunch of information into a blog post, some of which I'm going to be sharing with you today. And I got the information, most of this information in the presentation today, I got from this book that you see here, the cover, it's called Weed Control in Natural Areas in the Western United States. And this is a really great book and you can get each, each weed as its own little chapter and you can get each weed or each chapter for free online. If you just go to Google and type in UC Weed Report, you see weed report and the name of the weed you're interested in, then the, the chapter from this book will come up. So this is a really great resource. Um, other additional information I got that I'm gonna be talking about today, I've gained from talking with experts from UC Davis and UC Cooperative Extension who um, have done a lot of research with weeds. So I'm guessing some of you on the call tonight may not have very much experience using herbicides. Um, and so I just wanted to give a little kind of logistical background on, on herbicide use. So I'm just going to be probably talking about three herbicides today. And all of the herbicides I'll be talking about today are registered for use on rangelands in California, which means that they're legal to use on California rangelands. And there's two different kinds of pesticides uh, generally that are out there. There's general use pesticides and state resides. So the three herbicides I'll be talking about today are all general use pesticides, meaning that um, in order to purchase and use these herbicides, you only need to get an operator ID. So what is an operator ID and how do you get it? Um, operator IDs are free and you can get them from your county agricultural commissioner's office. You don't need to take any kind of test in order to get an operator ID, but you do need to show a property map. Um, to the Ag Commissioner's Office in order to get that property ID. And once you get that, you can go ahead and um, purchase and, and use that particular herbicide for that particular project. Um, none of the herbicides that I'm going to be talking about today are evicted pesticides when applied to rangeland. So um, an example of a state restricted uh, pesticide or herbicide is 2,4-D that some people use on rangeland. So for those kinds of herbicides, before you can purchase or spray them, you'll need two things. You'll need either a private or cater certificate and a restricted materials permit. And in order to get your private or commercial applicator certificate, you need to take a test through your agricultural commissioner's office. So get in contact um, with your ag commissioner if you intend to use any of the state restricted pesticides like 2,4-D for example. Okay, so now I wanna transition into a little bit of plant ID. So I'm gonna go through some weeds um, and then I'm going to talk about um, an example of an herbicide that's effective at con controlling these weeds. So I want to start out by talking about some thistles. And so here are four thistles. These are four purple flowered thistles that are the top three are fairly common throughout a lot of California. Um, and the one on the bottom left is purple star thistle. It's not like that widespread, but where it occurs, it can become very invasive. So I just wanted to put all of these purple flowered thistles on one slide so you can kind of compare them, but I'm gonna go into each one um, in a little bit more detail. And I'll go quickly th through these. Um, but so this is a uh, milk thistle and milk thistle has um, kind of a large flower, purple flower head with kind of that substantial <laughs> spiny <laughs> bracts, I guess they might be below the, the flower itself. And one of the main ways that you can tell that it's milk thistle, even if it doesn't have flower heads on it yet, is that the leaves are really big, kind of substantial, thick, wide leaves that have milky veins or veins that are white in color that you can see um, with the arrows I've got pointing to some of the milky veins there. 
This is Italian thistle. It's another thistle that's got a much smaller flower. Um, and if you look at the picture on the right, that's a thistle plant. And I think of Italian thistle as being a little bit spindly, kind of skinny <laughs> um, uh, thistle. This is bull thistle. And this one, again, has a big um, purple flower. And it has what's called a large spiny bract below the flower head. And so it looks like a big prickly globe underneath the flower that helps you know that it's bull thistle. Although a lot of times, you know, you're going to see the plant without the flower on it. So how do you know if it's bull thistle or Italian thistle? And I have to have a hard time telling those two species apart unless it has flower heads on it. So I went to um, the book that I mentioned uh, at the beginning of the presentation and it describes the leaves for this plant bull thistle. The leaves are three to 12 inches long, deeply lobed with coarse prickly hairs on top and woolly hairs underneath. The leaves have sharp spines along the midrib and at the top of the lobes and the tip resembles a spear. So I think um, if we kind of try to keep those things in mind, the um, coarse prickly hairs on top of the leaf and the woolly hairs underneath the leaf, I think that will be, might be able to help us uh, just differentiate it from Italian thistle. And then the last one that I wanted to point out was purple star thistle. Um, and you can see here on the picture on the right, the kind of um, narrow leaves and don't look like a typical thistle leaf. And then you can see that below the purple flower, they've got these pretty thick substantial spines underneath. So those are the, the four kind of common purple starred thistles. And then the last thistle I wanted to talk about is yellow star thistle. And the picture on the left shows a yellow star thistle before it has started flowering. So all of the those spines you see there are are in fact just spines and not um, uh, not the flower head itself. And I'm going to see if I can get a laser pointer here. Okay. So this is just uh, the spines before. It's like a bud at this point. And then over here, you can see that right here, this is the flower itself. So it's just initiating the flower development here. And then here's kind of like flower expansion. And then here it's in full bloom. So sometimes people think that this is the flower, but it's not, you need to wait until the kind of center yellow part comes out. And the, when it's in flower helps you figure out when the best time to control it is. So you wanna be able to know the difference between when it's a bud versus when it's in flower. Another thing that helps um, distinguish yellow star thistle is that the leaves of yellow star thistle, they form wavy wings along the stem of the plant. So that can help you identify yellow star thistle as well. So when I first started my job here, a lot of people would come to me and say, hey, I've got this weed, you know, what's gonna kill it? And like, when should I spray? When's the best time to spray? What other plants? will this herbicide kill in my field? Is it gonna kill stuff I don't want it to kill? And what about my pets? Or what about my cattle or you know, sheep or goats? Is this herbicide gonna affect any of my animals? And so I put together um, kind of a table of a bunch of different herbicides and um, you know, all these different questions that I'm getting repeatedly from ranchers and other folks who are trying to pull weeds. So um, is, the herbicide I'm talking about here is transline or clopyrrolid, and this is an herbicide that is effective on all of those tools that I just went through. So this is one option. There's other options as well you can use. Um, one example of an option that is pretty effective on controlling thistles, it is a post-emergent, which means, so pre-emergent, you would spray pre-emergent herbicide if you were going to spray um, before the seeds germinate. So you would kind of need to know where in the area the, the plants are going to occur based on where you've seen them the previous year, or a post-emergent herbicide, which is you would use after the seeds of the weed have already germinated. So this uh, clopyrrolid is a post-emergent, and the best time to spray post-emergence is after all of the weed seed has germinated, but before the plants get big. And the target plants for this herbicide is uh, thistles and legumes, so clovers are a legume. So a lot of people always ask me, well, is this herbicide gonna kill my clovers? And pretty much, I think all the herbicides I'm gonna talk about today, yes, unfortunately, they will kill your clovers, um, but this one will not kill your grasses if you're trying to maintain livestock. 
um, this, this herbicide will not target your grasses. And then in terms of restrictions for um, clopyrrolid, there are no restrictions on grazing following the application of transline at the labeled rate. So you don't have to worry about removing your um, animals out of the field. Um, but for applications to rangeland, they do recommend for humans not to enter treated areas until the sprays have dried. But for early entry, if you're gonna go in before the sprays have dried, wear eye protection, chemical resistant gloves, made of any waterproof material, long sleeve shirts, long pants, shoes, and socks. So they just want you to be really cautious before going in. I think it's, I don't know how long exactly it takes for these herbicides to dry up, but I think it's within a few hours. So it's not that long of a time period. Um, and in the research I did, I, I found that clopyrrolid is very effective for yellow star thistle in addition to the other thistles that I just talked about. So this um, plant onto a, another plant. So this is fiddle neck and fiddle neck is toxic to livestock, um, but it's also a native plant. So that kind of complicates things a little bit. So it's really well adapted to our climate here in California. Um, and so it does really well. And the way to identify is it, it is that it's got these little yellow flowers and the inflorescence or the flower stalk is kind of coiled like the neck of a fiddle and it also has these stiff prickly hairs that if you touch them are kind of painful. <laughs> so, but, so a lot of people, even though these are native because they've got those stiff prickly hairs and because they're toxic to livestock, sometimes people are wanting to control them so their livestock don't get sick or potentially die. Although in most situations, your livestock are just gonna avoid it and it's not gonna be a problem. But there have been situations where there's maybe not really anything else for the livestock to eat and they eat a bunch of fiddle neck and it can cause um, some, some serious damage. Another plant I wanted to mention is um, Medusa head and this is a grass. And these long uh, things that you see here, these are called awns. And that's one way to identify Medusa head. Medusa head, it has these very long awns. And uh, once they start drying, they start twisting um, kind of like the hair of Medusa, which I think is why it's called Medusa head. <laughs> and when the seeds fall from the plant, this is the spike here. And the spike remains after the seed heads, uh, or sorry, after the seeds fall off. So even um, after the seeds are gone, you can still kind of identify the plant because this will remain. And these will actually remain even into the next year. So, you know, one spring, you can see some of these um, kind of skeletons from the previous year of where the plants had been. So that kind of gives you a clue as to, to where you might find uh, this species um, coming up this year. So this, um, okay, I can't see the top of my screen. And <laughs> so how do I, do you guys know how to make the little thing at the top of your screen? <laughs> so you can see the top of your slide. You may be able to move it, but I'm not sure. Okay. Um, so I think this is milestone and I have to admit that I don't know uh, the name. <laughs> Maybe Rebecca, if you can read that for me. And remind yeah, me it's the... aminopyrrolid. Aminopyrrolid, okay. So that's the herbicide that I wanna talk about next. And that herbicide is effective on all of the, all of the thistles that I've already talked about and on these two new additional species that I talked about. Um, so this can be used as a pre-emergent. So you can spray it before the seeds uh, plants have germinated, or it can be used as a post-emergent after the plants have germinated. And the best time to spray this particular herbicide is January through March. And it kills thistles and legumes and some other broad leaves. But again, it does not kill grasses and it does kill clover. So again, legumes, or clovers are legumes. And so um, this will kill legumes as well. So if you have a particularly good area, a patch of clovers that you don't want to be impacted, then maybe you might think about using some other kind of um, control method other than, or um, maybe do a refeeding of clovers after you've done the herbicide treatment. In terms of um, grazing or pet or human restrictions for this herbicide, there's no restriction on grazing as long as you're using the, the labeled rate. So what's on the label, how much they say you can use. Um, they do say that you don't wanna allow workers or anybody to enter into areas until the sprays have dried, just like the other one. 
Um, and they also note on the label that herbicide application palatability of certain poisonous plants. So they recommend not grazing treated areas until poisonous plants are dry or are no longer palatable to livestock. Some research I've done noted that this is the best option to control yellow star thistle, and it's highly effective on the other thistles as well. And one research, uh, one study showed that um, this herbicide provided up to 90% control of Medusa head in the Central Valley. So the next plant I wanted to mention um, is uh, a lot of the ranchers in my area call it hellweed. <laughs> um, so this plant, Cardaria draba, I believe is the scientific name. This is, I think sometimes it's found in a little bit with the always have to be found in wet areas. So this ha plant has alternate little white flowers. It's in the mustard family. So it's got uh, each flower has four little tiny petals. Um, just like a, any, you know, any vegetable in the, the mustard family, broccoli and things like that. And so um, apparently this, so the next herbicide I'm going to talk about is chlorosulfuron. And I don't even know if that's exactly how you say it, but Telar is another name for it. And this particular herbicide is apparently one of the best control options for plants in the Cardaria genus. So in the plants in the genus that this hellweed <laughs> um, is in. So this is used as a pre-emergent or a post-emergent. So you can spray it before or after the seedlings have germinated. Um, so you want to spray around the time of the first rains or a little before or after. The, but you want to make sure you spray before the seedlings get big. You're going to have more effective control if you spray when they're young. This plant has, uh, sorry, this herbicide has particular plant species that it designed to kill. So they really recommend that you check the label for the specific plants that it's targeted. Um, but, but, but plants in this genus is one of them. In terms of grazing or pet restrictions, there's no grazing or hay harvest restrictions for any livestock, including lactating animals, uh, with application rates up to one and a third ounces per acre. acre. Um, and there's no exposure, no exposures required for any animals. Um, so that's it for for sulfuron. Um, and with that, I'm going to wrap it up. I have lots more weeds I want to show you and <laughs> some other herbicides as well, but I think I'm running a little bit low on time. So I'm going to um, end it there. And I just want to give a little reminder to whenever you're using herbicide, you always want to read and follow the herbicide label. That's extremely important. And like I mentioned at the beginning of the presentation, if you have particular questions about um, what herbicide to use or how much to spray, or if you have multiple species, you know, weeds that you're trying to kill, what herbicide would be best to you know, affect all of those different plants, um, the, what you really wanna do is contact um, a pest control advisor, a certified pest control advisor. And the last thing I wanted just to remind you was to check out this book, Weed Control in Natural Areas in the Western United States, because it has tons and tons of really good information about how to identify weeds and all of the different um, control methods that are available for those various weeds. And with that, I'm going to stop sharing and call it a wrap.